All right. Hey everyone, welcome. Thanks for making it to White Paper Circles today. A few things we're going to talk about Atom 2.0. So diving into Cosmos and some of the proposed changes to the roadmap of where we can expect to see Cosmos developing as time goes on. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm by no means an expert, but here just to open up a discussion, chat, bounce ideas off each other and learn as a collective group. So I'm gonna go over a few general components of Cosmos to start. So a quick overview here. So with it's described themselves, Cosmos is a decentralized network of independent parallel blockchains, each powered by BFT consensus algorithms like Tendermint. And so you can think of it as a consortium of blockchains, like a, a web of some different blockchains and Cosmos works to create ways to connect each chain with, with other ones. And so we'll get into how that is being used nowadays. Few components for starters. So Cosmos is very modular. And rather than having to build a whole blockchain from scratch, you can use different SDKs that Cosmos offers to only focus on specific parts of exactly what you're building out. And so as you can see, there are three three main layers that we'll be talking about are the application network and consensus layers. But with these, you can abstract other and with these, you can abstract away a lot of the double work and choose directly customizable parts that you're interested in. So, and this and this is all from the original Cosmos white paper. And so the way they pose it as well is they talk about Cos as Cosmos being a blockchain 3.0. And so the first idea is that you have Bitcoin, which is your blockchain 1.0. It's trick, for the most part, it's transactions. And then as you work your way, to Ethereum, we can think of that as being caused as a blockchain 2.0, because that is when you can actually build dApps and other things off of, I mean, using EVM. And then Cosmos 3.0 is kind of that next step in blockchain development. So a few quick things to show as well. Um, something that's great about Cosmos is that it allows for it, using its like ABCI or application blockchain interface, you can interact in most languages. And because of this, it provides more flexibility for developers. And then just a few properties as well. So it can, you can have public or private chains, typically proof of stake. And it is, you have upwards of a thousand transactions per second. You have instant finality, You're it uses Tendermint and you only need one third Byzantine nodes in this case, and then it's highly modular. Um, now, another uh, exciting component about Cosmos as well is your IBC. And so this is in your inner blockchain communication and it allows for you to interact with other chains. And so it chains. And so it opens up this cross chain like, like communication um, and functionality. And so, so I'll put up the chat here too. Oh. Slide goes to IBC and this is so he's smiling. I'm smiling because I, I made this exact graphic like five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> Do you want to talk at this point? I'm just going through. Did you, right, go ahead. No? I'm getting so, uh, I'm, I'm so self-conscious going through this, but it's exciting. I'm totally like I'm, I'm telling Tiffany before that too, same thing. Um, and so the idea here as well is rather than actually being able to, like, well, first for starters, all tokens, imagine you're inter inter interacting between two different ecosystems, all of the tokens that you interact with will stay, remain native. And so they'll stay on that token, but you'll have, I believe they're called um, like vouchers, you know, have vouchers that are, have the value of a certain of that other token, but can be used on your on the like, different chain. And so, let's say we have in in this case, kind of the way that IBC works, in a, like as a brief overview, is that they essentially create like environment A and B. Both blockchains create light nodes of one another, and so they actually have here. Let's see. So they'll pass on information, and like let's say when there is some, a transaction that goes through, that'll use um, it will use this idea of vouchers, and so give a voucher in whatever denomination of token A is in. I'm not really doing a good job of explaining this. Let me let me start over. So imagine we have like A wants to transfer tokens to B. Well, the way this will work is it'll A will have a voucher that will be able to be transmitted to, and it'll be transmitted to B into this blockchain. And because of this, then rather than actually being able to transfer tokens that aren't native to the local system, using these vouchers allows for like a store value and can have similar properties 
to the tokens. It's just it's kind of like a, it's a voucher that it's basically like value. Give the tokens off. It's, it is like that. Like, like in the, yeah, that's great. Exactly. So it is, yeah, it's a good way to get somewhere to wrapped. And so then, um, once these are so, the next thing I want to get into briefly is how bridges would work in like with non tenement chains. So there are two different types of considerations here. So the first is for like fast finality chains, and those typically tend to be pretty easy. So when, when we're uh, like when we're looking at proof of stake, it's pretty easy to use IBC to connect these change, chains. That being said, if we have like more probabilistic finality, like let's say proof of work, then they need to use something called a peg zone. And so I don't actually know a ton about this, but I'll, I'll briefly dive into what the peg zone is. I mean, if anyone else wants to knows anything and wants to dive into it, they can and pick up where I left, wherever I leave off. But um, can you go over what the difference is between the two? Probabilistic, um, yeah, so probabilistic, let's give me describe it. It just talks about, um, so the difference is as you develop more blocks, then you, um, for probabilistic finality, I believe, I, I was kind of confused the two, but a lot of the times, the more blocks you develop, then the more likely you, are to, you get to get the point of finality. And so I'm actually not entirely sure of how it's used in, um, yeah, so the difference is saying that um, in a fast finality chain, right, once a block is created, um, it can basically like never get reverted. Mm -hmm. um, so like after all, everyone, you know, like the tether man, right, you cover like the three like phase voting, right? After you finish that last phase of voting, right, like this block, right, is guaranteed to be part of the chain. You never like revert it. Um, whereas in a probabilistic finality chain, right, that's not necessarily the case, right? There's like different blocks being broadcast by different miners all the time. And, like, you know, one block might become like the new chain head, but then there might be another fork with like more work that gets discovered later right and then that new fork becomes head of the chain right and this block that you thought was head of chain is not anymore um so the reason this is probabilistic finality is that the longer that the more blocks that um are produced on top of your block right the higher the probability that your block is in the canonical main chain right because the last likelihood of there being another fork somewhere out there with more work um than than the than the fork that your block is can um, a chain like shift from being fast finality to probabilistic? No, generally, so so like being like probabilistic or fast finality is a feature of the consensus mechanism. Um, the one exception to this is like heap two, which is like kind of a hybrid between the two. Mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of off topic, but basically, um, the way that heap two works is that um, you have like right, this, you have like epochs of like thirty two blocks. And like reorg can happen within each epoch, right? But like between epochs, like stuff is standard at least. It's like a final round of voting by the end of epoch, right? Yeah. I think two epochs. I think two epochs. Yeah, two epochs. Yeah. Two epochs. I was, what was I going to say? I was trying to think about how, I'm trying to give an overview of how this is used in practice, but I don't know, maybe it's just off topic. Um, um, I mean, one example of that, like that's why people say like you should wait for like six blocks, right, to ensure Good that block. the transaction is like included. Your block confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of this, it's like that's why it's like a, a something you have to think about when you're trying to bridge between a probability chain and uh, a finality chain because um, if you look at the most recent block and you got a certain transaction, so you want to like bridge the tokens that you got in this recent block from Ethereum, for example, and bridge that into. Uh, like, like chain on Cosmos as sense of finality. Uh, if you bridge it, it uh, and basically kind of like lock those funds in the Ethereum chain, well, if that if the Ethereum chain, uh, like the block in which you got the transactions in, gets reverted or like you know, there's a fork and that block becomes invalid, and, and then suddenly you don't have money on Ethereum anymore because the, the industry changed basically. Mm -hmm. um, but you you had already bridged tokens onto the sense of finality chain, uh, and you can't undo it on the sense of finality chain. So okay. In order to make sure that whatever funds you basically take out of Ethereum uh, are actually yours, and that block that where you got the funds didn't get converted, you have to uh, usually, I think, with peg zones, much faster. Exactly, you have to like wait a ton of blocks, so you have like really high uh, guarantee um, that that block won't be reverted, uh, and then you can like kind of save the proofs. And I think like was it Evmos or some some or the peg zone with Ethereum that so, like, waited like a hundred blocks or something like that. Yeah, that's uh, Peggy. Yeah. No, that's... I'm not sure if that's that complex. Or like, if yeah. that was specific Peggy, don't have to think about it. Yeah, like, you should have to do it. 
Um, sweet. Well, I'm um, kind of diving this next just a little diagram that dives into how it interacts, like bridge these non-pegamid chains. And so this idea here, like Peggy's our refers to our peg zone, we have our two ecosystems here. And so let's go like Ethereum and Cosmos. And so you know, there are a few components here. And, and like I said, I don't actually know a ton about this, but the idea is that I mean, you have your Ethereum smart contracts that deal with how tokens and funds are distributed, whatever it may be. And then you have your witnesses who and relayers who interact between your Ethereum and your, your peg zone. And so it just passes on these bundles of, I believe it's just like the bundles of uh, just information and like all the, it's, it serves as an, ex, as an additional party that helps to yeah, relay the information between your peg zone and Ethereum. And it does this through kind of just serving as an extra party that will, um, what was I gonna say? Like what it's, it's essentially just adding one other person that allows for this, um, or sorry, there's two other parties, the relayer and the witness who oversees this, I mean, these, these transactions go through and kind of serves as a catalyst between your Ethereum and Cosmos, or I guess Cosmos and whatever other, um, whatever, uh, what, whichever other network you'd be interacting with. Um, okay, and then, let's see what else after this. And then briefly, just with scalability too. So a lot of the times we see a lot of the bottleneck coming from an application layer. And so as time, what one of the big, like what, what Cosmos sees, or at least what they said in the paper, what they see as their future at some point will be using like multi-chain architecture. And this is because I mean, every chain will have its scalability limits and there's always an up or down for that. And so it'll start to look, at, it'll look towards creating more new chains. And so it's, it's actually funny too, because this is what, when I talked to a lot of Boost of Cosmoverse, they said that they, like if, if one chain ever gets too busy or hectic, whatever, however you want to refer to it, they'll just build another. And it's funny hearing a lot of people saying that same thing. They they don't mind using, not that there's anything wrong with it, but they all have that same solution for like horizontal scalability. And, um, and they all kind of said it in the same way too. Like I was talking to kind of Juno, I think. Um, and then that's, that's what they said, and we started laughing. Um, okay, so I mean, that was kind of a lot of bits and pieces here and there. Any questions or anything else you want to go over from that? Can you go back to the slide? Can yeah. you talk about the role of the witness? Yeah, so I believe that the witness, um, just over, well, so the relayer is the one who, what is, it's the, um, So I just went over this earlier today. So I'm still a little new to me too. But the witness oversees the actually I think I'm forgetting. They're running oh, Ethereum nodes <clears throat> and are listening for events on Ethereum and then they sign in. They sign a message saying like, hey, we we didn't have what this happened, they submitted to the peg zone. I mean the, these peg zones, I mean, there's not one peg zone anymore. Like these are just like word chains. There's like Axelon or Interact Ethereum. Multiple people, multiple chains are in this bank zone. Axel is probably the most popular. I'm trying to remember, can you have the witness and the relayer be the same party? Uh, the or witness and the signers are usually the same party. The relayer is a pretty untrusted party at this point, where it's like, what happens is the signers, so, so, so the witness is basically someone who's seen something happen on Ethereum and attesting to it, like, you know, on Cosmos. Uh, the the re signers are the opposite, right? There's Seeing something happen on Cosmos, they're signing it in a way that's easily uh, verifiable on Ethereum and then posting it. The relayer is just all they're doing it because the signers are posting things on the peg zone chain instead of on Ethereum because it's cheaper. The relayers are just like this untrusted entity that's just like seeing all the sign. Once there's enough signatures from the signers on the peg zone, they just like broadcast that transaction. Okay. Gotcha. Users can often, often be their own relayers even. So do you know what's being done to change this untrustworthiness? No, no, there any proof? The, 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 the real error is like, it, what I mean by untrustworthy, it's like, it's a good thing that you don't have to trust. Anyone can run a real error. It's not like- Oh, so, oh, so it's, you don't have to like, confide in it. You can just know that it's just a direct broadcast of whatever transactions yeah. from the peg chain yeah. are happening. So the signer and witnesses are trusted parties. Okay. And really, really, okay, so it is just, yeah, really, it's just passing on that information. Yeah. Okay. And so these zones are just like, um, just kind of like another app chain and they have validated, or like, the, or the, again, just like a, a stake that's being put up for the witnesses to mm -hmm. witnesses. Yeah, so like, 
usually, I mean, in Maxwell case, the signers of the witnesses are also just the validators of that structure. Mm -hmm. And then Axelar like supports many chains other than just Ethereum now. So that can really connect to like any you know, chain basically. And so uh, they have an opt-in system where individual validators can decide to be signer slash witnesses for a different action so for, for different EVM chains. So like I think yeah so different ones have different levels of different numbers of validators. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um let's see. And so also so I don't know I guess we'll move on to this next part. Uh, I just threw so a few things in here. I don't know a ton about specifically what they all do, but I'm interested in like opening up a discussion here about how we could and we'll go over this and we can open up a little more and talk about kind of future of like cross blockchain compatibility and development. So you have a few things that happened so far, a few upgrades. So the, um, the first is the idea of the gravity decks, which um, is just a pretty standard. It's funny, I did not know you'd be here. So if you want to give a more in depth uh, kind of comparison between the gravity decks and osmosis, that'd be great. But my understanding is that gravity decks is much more traditional, whereas, I mean, osmosis, you have your own hub token and you're much more like innovative in the space whereas your you gravity decks is just your kind of standard decks i mean order book model like am i for token swaps all that good stuff um would you mind giving a little rundown of comparison between gravity decks gravity decks? Decks. yeah um we said hub did you mean that chain link yeah so okay so anyway one thing i'll say about this is like this concept of hubs is like a misnomer. Like I, I think that the entire idea of, okay, so Cosmos and Cosmos Hub, two like separate projects, right? Like Cosmos was just this idea of, hey, we can build a, you know, world of app chains and like they're all gonna be interconnecting and all this stuff. Cosmos Hub is one chain. The, the Cosmos network does not rely on Cosmos Hub in any like way. The Cosmos Hub like disappears. It, nothing in Cosmos stops working. Um, so what now, what, so the gravity decks was basically the Cosmos hub was, you know, I, I guess it was like this, like fundraising mechanism mm -hmm. where it raised funds to build this Cosmos network. And then it's like, well, we have this chain that doesn't do anything right now. We should find a use case for it. And so they decided, okay, the, the first attempt was like, Hey, let's build a Dex on this chain. And that's kind of what became gravity Dex. And then, you know, uh, we decided to also build a Dex chain at the same time. And, you know, they kind of just started competing. Um, the and I think Osmosis won out in that because, uh, you know, I think better UI and stuff and better, just better product. Uh, we had more. We had because we had a new token from scratch. We were able to like liquidity mine it to build up another liquidity that like was much higher than what the Gravity Dex had. And um, it was also just like. I mean, there was like, I, uh, I had issues with some of the things of the AMM that the Gravity Dex had, but I don't think that's like really the deciding factor. I think it was just the fast the fact that Osmosis was faster and had a better product. That's like, and then basically then basically what happened was the Cosmos Hub chain said, okay, we're not gonna win this Gravity Dex, this Dex competition. So they now removed the Gravity Dex from their chain. And now they're trying to figure out a new use case which is where Madden 2.0 comes in. Mm -hmm. So do you think that just by, Having the Cosmos name, the Gravity Dex got an advantage in that sense, or do you feel like you're always gonna have always had a sort of step ahead of them? No, I think that like I think that one of the pro I mean, my, I have a big issue with the fact that the Cosmos Hub has the Cosmos name in it. I think you know I would like to see the Cosmos Hub change its name mm -hmm. to you know maybe like the Atom Hub or something like that, or Atomic Hub or something. Um, that makes it very much more clear that like hey, this one chain is not representative of the whole ecosystem. Okay. So what in that case, what is the purpose of these hubs in general? If you have IBC connect between chains, uh, that's what they're trying to figure out right now. Okay. They're playing around. What was it? Okay, well, what was the original intent? The original intent was to be a that all IBC messages will route through this one yeah. chain. And so, but if you what ended up happening in practice was no one wanted to route through a single chain everyone, all the chains said, hey, we're gonna build up point-to-point -point connections. That actually kind of started because of, because of osmosis, where what happened was, you know, I, in my, I think that the hub-based routing is wrong in general, but like the reason it didn't take off was when the hub 
had its own DEX, our worry as osmosis was like, wait, if everyone's routing through the hub, they're going to get all the volume. Yeah. So we're like, okay, no, we're not going to take other tokens to the hub. We're going to only accept direct connections to osmosis directly. Oh, sure. And that kind of triggered this like thing where like everyone just started using direct connections. And I think that was the right thing to do in general, because otherwise, if you have a hub and spoke system, if that chain goes, the hub goes down, then all IBC routing stops. I guess the general um, like whole thing right now in Cosmos is this uh, debate between like, so the talk I gave at Cosmoverse was basically about this was like, you know, IBC routing has gone from this, like it was intended to be a hub and spoke system, but it actually turned into a mesh network. So yeah. And then, you know, one of the big things that the hub is trying to do right now that people know is trying to make security a very hub and spoke system where it's saying, like, hey, everyone should rely on Cosmos hub for security. And I was actually a, a big pusher of that until I realized that, wait a second, you can actually have security also be a mesh network. And so, um, yeah. Is there, a, is there any like, I don't know, like uh, efficiency downside to having uh, to open up IBC connections uh, for every interchange you want to track with? Is there like any? Yeah, you have to have more, uh, so there's more connections, it's n squared and the number of connections. Yeah. And uh, you need to have relayers running between all of them. Okay? Oh. You need to have like, what happens in IBC is if there isn't a packet that's sent between two chains on a connection regularly enough, the channel expires. It makes sense. Whatever the unbonding period is, it has to have a packet update at least that frequently. Um, and so, if you have, you know, right now we have 50 chains, but not one, one thing to note is not all of them have connections to each other. Like, right. there's a lot of chains that don't need to interact with each other, right? And so, they don't actually have connections. Um, but even with 50 chains, you know, that's like around 50 factorial like number of connections. And so, um, relaying gets more and more expensive because of that. Now, I think that there's a claim here that like, uh, I, I mean, one, I think that the, I think there's a little bit of a misnomer that the cost of relaying doesn't really get more expensive with the number of connections. It actually just gets more expensive with the number of nodes, with the number of chains. Because let's say you're running a relayer. Let's say you, you start a new chain, um, you know, and you want to connect to the entire IBC network. What is the highest cost is the is not actually the number of connections, it's the running nodes for all of the chains that you want to connect to and run a layer between. And so, you know, there was an argument that in the hub and spoke system, if you start a new chain, you only have to run two nodes yourself and the cost was hub, and then you let the cost of hub handle everything else, like the routing everywhere else. Now if you start a new chain, you have to set up relayers to like every other chain, so 50 other chains. And that's much higher overhead. Um, there are solutions to this, but like they're not. The solution is in the hub. <laughs> uh, the solution is you can use a hub as a bulletin board. So I call this like HTTP versus HTTPS. So like HTTP is like, uh, you know, it's a location-based authentication, right? You have an IP address and that's what you use to authenticate people, right? And so it's very path dependent on like, where did this, what path did the packet come from, right? So let's say, so basically what's happening right now is in any sort of interchange in IBC, like let's say you have three chains, you know, Osmosis, Juno, Cosmos Hub, right? A token sent from Juno to Osmosis is different than one sent from Juno to the hub to Osmosis, right? And these are not fungible with each other. Mm -hmm. So the claim that is that, okay, well, we already live in this world now that the, the things that are used in like applications are the direct ones, right? If you send it, by the multi hop route, this is going to be like an unrecognized token. So what you have to do is you have to unwind it and send it back forward. What can you do to, so why are they not punchable? It's because like the trust model is different, right? You have to, if you take the hub one, you have this additional trust of the, on the hub, but while the direct connection does it. Uh, so going back to HTTP versus HTTPS, um, HTTPS like says like, hey, we're actually just not going to care what route this packet comes from. We're just going to care about the identity. So what you can do is say like, hey, you can basically you can use something like the hub or anything really as a bulletin board where you can put a packet that you don't, you know, you just want to send it to, you can send it to the hub and just post it there and let another relayer pick up that packet and send it to osmosis. And that's okay because osmosis does the end-to-end -end authentication. It, it checks to make sure that this uh, is signed by Juno validators, not, it doesn't, it doesn't 
without this, you, we would basically, in the current multi-hop system, what would happen is, you know, Juno validator signing for the hub, hub authenticates it, and then the hub signs into osmosis. All osmosis checked is, did the hub say this is correct? We need to change that to be like, no, no, no. No matter how many hops it came from, all that they're checking is to see that the Juno signing was correct. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but then what you turn you, the, the, the goal is you turn the intermediary chains into untrusted, like relayers, basically. So the relayer, the benefit is that the relayer, instead of having to like follow information on every chain, they can just look at what's listed on the hub and then yeah. relay that information. Yeah, you, I call it, I call it like a, a bulletin board, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, you just post stuff on the bulletin board, someone else picks it up and finishes the other part. You don't need to have the same relayer doing every step of it, of the pass along information. And you can use anything as the bulletin board. So then how much would you say, I mean, of course, it seems like Cosmos Hub wants to be at the center of all this, they want to be this, I mean, this bulletin yeah. board. How much pushback do you think, I mean, is there kind of a pull and give and take between transition to more of a mesh system versus like Cosmos Hub trying to reel it back into this yeah. other model? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'll be completely honest. I'm a Adam minimalist, <laughs> Cosmos maximalist. <laughs> Actually, what do you mean? Um, so, like when you send it to a full like uh, ops, yeah, but it has like different, like if it was to be like the same, how would yeah. that actually work? You, you just don't throw right, right, right now. How it works is like once the packet goes from Juno to the hub, it the, the hub verifies that and then and then you know it signs its own packet to send to osmosis, right? What it needs to do is stop throwing away the authentication information to Ju Juno and just pack it up along with the packet that it forwards to as well. So why don't we just do that right now? It's just, uh, just want to implement it. <laughs> yeah. yeah it just seems like, I mean, it seems like the, I, I, I think that like right now, it's just not like worth the time to implement because we're not at the point yet where, I think like, you know, once we have thousands of chains, then yes, this will become a bottleneck. We're just not there yet. So it's like, you know, I think there's higher priority stuff to do. Makes sense. Cool. Um, Thank you. That was great. Uh, a few other things too. Just um, I'm just kind of going to go over a few updates that I see a lot of potential in. So kind of in, uh, improvements here to few modules, and then there's the idea of a Cosmos fee grant module, and so it's that is changing the way that like changing the different denominations and fees. Uh, I think that was changing that's gas fees. That's what it was. It's changing. It's updating gas fees to be part of governance so that. And it's kind of changing this system to allow for uh, improvements in gas fees and uh, adjustments more easily. And then also the idea of like, launching a gravity bridge back in December. So starting to get into, I mean, usually like implementing more IBC. And so also going forward, a few things that are on the horizon, which are pretty exciting. And I'd love to hear if anyone else has heard about anything or has any thoughts on these. So this idea of like groups in the Cosmos SDK. So changing voting to be more weight-based, this global fee. So it changes your like, denominations and fees to be also by like, governance parameters. And so the like, gas can be paid in different in denominations as well. Idea of liquid staking um, as, and that's should be coming up in a few months. So I'm implementing more liquid staking and then idea of layered security. So this is where yeah, consumer chains combine their own staking token validator set with their provider chain validator set. And so it's providing more modularity modularity with your idea of your, your validator sets. So giving more, giving the, like giving builders more flexibility with what, how they want to use their validators. Um, so does anyone want to go over any of these things? Like I said, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no expert on these, but these were things that caught my attention that I was reading through. So by denominations, you mean different tokens? <laughs> it's, Mix of, yeah, I think yeah. It's that and also, I mean, just any physical domination of. Yeah, oh, this just means you can, yeah, the announce is what we call the token means, but yeah, it's just saying that you can pay, allow people to pay transaction fees with more than one token. This is on the hub, right? This is on the hub. It doesn't actually exist on the hub right now. Yeah. It does exist on the hub. Yeah, I was going to say, but it works on osmosis because we have a DEX. And so what we're able to do is, you know, part of the problem with like these global fees is that like, 
validators have to start finding a minimum fee in like every single token that they that they want to be able to accept, right? And that's annoying. So in osmosis, we they only define a minimum fee in Osmo, and then whatever you do a trade or whatever you try to pay transaction fees with the USDC, it just checks the key off of USDC with Osmo and oh, okay, this is how we how we should weight this. The plan is then to take these key off information from osmosis, send give this as IBC data to other chains, so then they can all other chains can also start uh, accepting transaction fees. Yeah, so in osmosis, what we do is uh, we collect them all and then do one batch swap at the end of the day and distribute them in Osmo. Uh, chains can choose if they want to distribute in anything or they can, uh, so also we're doing like cross chain swaps where like the chain can then, you know, like the different chain like start something and like go IDC swap into the stars and then send it back and then distribute. And I believe too, you can also, I think in some cases they're looking to like have like combined bundles of token uh, transactions or tokens as well. So it doesn't all have to just be in one. I mean, it, now that there are multiple different types of tokens that you can receive gas fees in, it also includes like different like, combinations of different tokens and different quantities, which is pretty cool. Um, and then what was I going to say? That's else about uh. So the liquid staking module allows that like, you can do liquid staking without the module, like so. You have this already, where like Stride is a chain that like launched right. recently that does liquid staking on for like multiple chains on Cosmos. The purpose of the liquid staking module is to make it like backward compatible in the sense that so on Stride, I have to have liquid atoms and then I put them in Stride and get like the staked atoms. Mm -hmm. Uh, the liquid staking module is the goal is to make it easier to if I already have a staking position, I can convert it to a a liquid state position without having to go Don't through the bad. logic period first. Oh, okay. Oh. So then, and again, this is true for anyone that, so then I guess, does Stride work with, I mean, I guess they're both compatible with one another. Okay. So the liquid state module is in line yet. So for for Stride right now is live. Stride, you right. just have to have, you know, already liquid atoms, like already non state like, like Accessible, yeah. Accessible funds are working. And then layered security, this is the Cosmos Hub that's security. So this is um, like, so I think you got this from like the Cosmos Hub white paper from right. like yeah. a year ago. Yeah. yeah, a lot of these like terminals and stuff that uh, we updated. Yeah. Um, so we have like interchain security, like there's like three steps to it. Uh, oh, my security talk. Uh, <laughs> basically, V1 is saying that like, hey, the full Cosmos Hub ballot intercept or the, the, yeah, the full cost of top value set should has to, has to like run validate on some chain. So it's a very like, you know, you need governance to like approve the, because it's like, you know, all validators have to do this, right? B2 says, hey, a subset of the cost of top validator set can, has, can run this chain. So that way you don't need all of the validators. Um, but it's still like both of the, the consumer chain is still like 100% like made up of top value. B3 is this idea that, hey, the consumer chain can have its own validator set, which also has its own staking system, but it can be augmented by security from the Cosmos Hub. So we would have our own like Osmo staking, but then you know you can also do atom staking and then have that count to contribute to security of Osmo system. Hmm. And the idea of mesh security is just this idea like, yeah, right, we can do that, but we should actually just do that bi-directional. Like, yes, atom staking can help augment osmosis security, but osmosis, security, osmosis cross staking can also help augment cosmos hub security. Is this, so I mean, this is essentially kind of like merge mining with the hub stake, right? Yeah. And it works, I, I had an interesting conversation about that about this, so it's like merge mining doesn't work because of uh, the fact that security is coming in like, you can drop, you can stop being a miner at any point, basically. And like your participation is like out of uh, like rewards in the future rather than a punishment that you get. Mm -hmm. So, with and the first day, you can actually have it. What do you think about that in general? Like, do you think, I mean, clearly, I'm not sure you're going to go to so you probably be that it's fine, but I, I feel like 
it, it feels like the Bitcoin model of, of uh, no uh, point of trades is just like only positive rewards seems like, I don't know, it just seems nicer as a concept. Um, leader, um, yeah, but um, I mean, as a mechanism designer, it's like you know, I think one of the main benefits for the state would be get by being able to use punishments, it's like you know, your design space increases a lot. Because, you know, yeah, I, I think it's a good thing that people should be punished for bad behavior, not just use our future rewards. Yeah, I guess you need underlying assumptions to be able to operate efficiently in any, in, in any system. But, Kind of worldwide, so it's, yeah, it's, you definitely need the stick, not the carrot in a lot of these cases. Yeah, I, I feel like it's just like it sounds more beautiful with the point, but it's also like like it's naive to think they they were going to do it. So realistically, you know, um, I guess so. Anyway, you mind talking a little bit about what's on the horizon for osmosis? Then, or uh, yeah, uh, I guess like osmosis. Three, I mean, three big things we're working on, which is uh, like being a better DEX, building up more like Osmosis DeFi stuff, and uh, providing more interchain services. So being a better DEX, you know, I mean, currently we're just like AMM, very much like Balancer, Inspire, big talk base, I guess, Balancer, not it. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're getting more like concentrated liquidity and stuff like that. So like, you know, the AMMs are not, you know, the AMMs are really good for bootstrapping ecosystems, but now that we bootstrap the ecosystem pretty well, like I think, you know, be competitive, we need to have better, like more efficient capital, like posture. Um, and then there's like this more DeFi stuff. So, you know, being a, a DEX is like, you know, just having a, a uh, just spot trading is okay. But, you know, if you have an actual DEX, you have to like have margin trading and perks and all, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and so we're helping bootstrap a little ecosystem of things to like be able to do that, right? And so you know, there's a project called Mars that is building like a lending protocol that will like you know we originally wanted to like build all of this in house, but then we realized like this that's a lot of it's really hard. <laughs> and so now we're kind of going for more like okay, let's help like I don't know, treat it almost like treat it almost like a little bit of an incubator where we help new projects start and like spin off and into their own chains. But like they're all still like contributing to at the end of the day for us we just want to maximize volume on osmosis so if more applications are like you know building tooling for osmosis or dragon ball you know that, that's helpful and then the last thing is like just interchange services so like you know how do we make osmosis like more central in the cosmos or like have more you know drive more volume through it is you know provide services to other chains so like the key walk that I mentioned, right? Like that's an example of osmosis, like providing services over IBC or interchain swaps, where it's like, oh, okay, you know, a chain wants to swap all the tokens instead of needing a DEX on its own chain, they can like do those trades over IBC. Uh, there's also just like other like miscellaneous things, like in, like an interchain name service, which is like, you know, not really DEX focused. It's more like a public code that we just saw that's like, you know, no one's built a proper one yet. So it's like, okay, and it's, and it's a big like, UX issue with Cosmos right now. So, like, okay, we're building an interchange name service. Like, why this? Is, is, that, is that that's built on top of like the universal uh, address and survey reference to the name? It's like kind of being to have one address on every, the same address on every. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the idea is you shouldn't need to be do that. So, that's actually like a very dangerous because um, that works fine when everything is like private key based account, like POAs. But once you have like People using multi save and smart contract wallets and stuff. Like, you shouldn't trust that you can just like take one account and like have it point, like change the prefix and have it work on a different chain. Like, this is what caused that issue on Optimism like a couple, like a month or two months ago when like they sent to, because what, what happened was like someone generated an Optimism address. No, what was it? Win Wintermute sent and made a multi save on Ethereum. And told Optimism to send it to that contract, that address on Optimism. And they own that multi sig address on Ethereum. They didn't actually own it on Optimism. And so someone else was able to generate that multi sig address yeah. and steal the funds. So, like, yeah, going forward, people should not rely that you can transfer addresses across chains. Mm -hmm. So, but that was, wasn't that thing that was being built up? And I like, used to like, like, I mean, no, it's a thing that, it, that does work right now, like, and it's like, 
but it's fine because most accounts are all EOAs. But as that changes, people try to rely on that. I remember, I think I saw this on your Twitter. It was uh, asking about your tool or something. Oh, this is true. Uh, like build like smart contract, uh, possible smart awesome contract. It's uh, that's part of your way you're talking about, right? Like you're just having kind of people bootstrapping their yeah. Their of those yeah. So what we have right now is we have a permission cause of order, which means that like to deploy a contract on the osmosis chain, you have to make a governance proposal. And this is like because we don't want it osmosis to get filled with like we don't want to become a generalized smart contracting chain and it has like a shit ton of that, like random stuff. I mean, our thing is like. We want to iterate quickly at the protocol layer. And the reason things like Ethereum can't iterate quickly is because once you have 10,000 people built on top of you, you can't iterate because you can't break anyone. Yeah. But if you only have 20 things built on top, it's fine. We can have lines of communication with everyone and say, like, okay, look, this is like the upgrade that we're planning on doing. Who is this breaking? How do we resolve these situations? Um, and so, yeah, that's why it's a more permission model. And the goal is eventually we want more. Apps to start breaking off on other chains. So that's the difference between like, well, like that's how you prevent. Uh, I guess the general ethos was, was uh, lowering the or one of the benefits of uh, app chains is lowering the, uh, the the space for vulnerabilities, right? Yeah. But like not having that is. Uh, yeah. So like the governance is the way you kind of open up some some flexibility about. It. Yeah, exactly. What do you think about this? Is a very general question, I guess, but. Um, what do you think about well, what's your opinion on the, the, the conversation around dev keys and like the upgrade chains or all that for decentralization and like you know it, a lot of these fucking chains they're, they're very active with these votes so you obviously need like the bill to do like kind of push changes but I mean what does that mean for decentralization and uh and trust? Yeah, I mean I think that so our current on our sources there's like no admin keys or dev keys that have like special privileges. Um, I think that like it maybe makes sense for governance to be able to elect certain keys to have the ability to like pause functionality. But just because in case there are like bugs or vulnerabilities and stuff, I think it's good to be able to like let's say like let's say a government selected and it, it shouldn't be like just develop it should be like a multi state or something right. But let's say that multi state decides hey we need to pause this functionality and then. What governance should be able to override that pause and right? like uh, you know, fire that uh, admin basically. That's my general view on like where. And then over time, as things become more stable, then we have that position. Like bootstrap phase out, yeah. So, kind of going back to something you said earlier, how did you start to develop volume within osmosis, especially from the beginning? Kind of gain traction and uh, you know, what about doing that now? I mean, there was, I think there was just a lot of pent up demand in Cosmos. Like, if you look at Cosmos, if you go on like CoinGecko and like look at the top 100 assets by market cap, I'm, I think Cosmos has the most other than like, mm. like more than Solana, Avalanche, Polygon, anything. And like all the chains that together. Just like the number of chain, number of Cosmos assets in the top 200 by market cap. Um, and so because of that, you know, there wasn't a lot of people listing. It was really annoying to list assets in to go to like categories. Yeah. Uh, you go to like Cosmos and just Oh. Okay. So ignore the numbers because point of those categories are really black. Mm -hmm. But if we look at it, see we have like point one. How many are in the top two hundred? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, Adina doesn't count. Uh, Adina's anchor. Okay, like all of CoinGecko's categories, like they have like random crap and stuff like that. But, okay, like, 11, like 11, 10, 10 11. Yeah. Um, so in that, like, I think that's more than like Solana or Polygon. Or something. Like, you know, that, obviously, some, there's some new ones, some of them have phased out. But like, basically, what happened, like, having centralized exchanges list a lot of these new assets is a lot of work because they have to run. New nodes for every single one. It wasn't as easy as adding the rest of one. And so there was a lot of like highly demanded assets that had like no liquidity venue for that. So I think just by launching the first decks that was available, that just like there was a lot of pent up demand for it. 
is, is that still a problem for like every kind of um, exchange we have to figure out how to uh, incorporate uh, like how to get loans on stuff? I remember listening to the podcast. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's all, it's all like that's on uh, the Stargate up for or the Stargate update. Yeah. Uh, and how it was like syncopated and things like that. Yeah. Is that still a thing? Yeah, I still think that it's a better change that we don't run more of these notes on. Yeah. And that, that's kind of that also relates to why like the finance tech like back then there isn't. Like if finance was more active and kind of like keep maintaining the way like the uh, oh. module reads and stuff like that, so it, it, like that kind of communication between parties like that. Um, I think that's a separate situation. That's just the fact that finance is like stock is like based off of the cost of SDK, but they don't really like communicate with us. Right. So that's like an independent thing. But this is just more like you know, risk getting like you. For the exchanges, like even though it should be simple because, like, you know, they know how to run the code for cost testing exchange, it's just a lot more work for them still to like run new chains. Um, and, like, you know, for example, like Evmos for them, you know, now it's like 74, but like, yeah, like it, it's not, if you look at like the places it's listed, it's not listed on any like major exchange, but Osmosis is like the primary exchange for it, which is like kind of cool. <laughs> Nice. Like I think uh, I remember I, I don't know if it's showed to anymore, but like back when uh, like, I don't know, it was like a few months ago, I was looking at it. Osmosis was the only token in the top hundred whose primary liquid primary exchange was the Dex, and even you need more 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 volume happens on that some other chains that on the swap side. Um, but yeah, I mean we tried. We, we, we purposely made it so like we tried to make Oscar not be this stuff like right. Does that help with competition as well? If you say specialized in that case. Yeah, it's like it was like, oh, there was demand for Oscar. Why would we give that volume to yeah. some other changes instead of like using that to like onboard people on Oscar? Very smart. Yeah. And would you say that? Because in terms of growth and like total total volume, has that been pretty consistent? Be growing as more as new teams have started to enter Cosmos and like start um, being involved, or I mean, what do you see? I mean, obviously, you see? I mean, it follows the, the market. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you go to info on Osmosis on Zone, I mean, okay, the big the, the big thing that happened in Cosmos, right? Is, you know, like the Terra rise and fall. Right? Mm -hmm. like, so if you look at the liquidity as well, yeah, like, I, I, I think I saw your 24 hour. Peak, uh, three months, like, yeah, <laughs> so, so that, that, that giant peak right there <laughs> gets clipped. It actually hit like over $500 million Jeez. on that day. Uh -huh. But also, that like same, like, you know, it, that, that crash of osmosis liquidity, like that staggered one was like, okay, that's like this price is falling. But then that's like, but if you change it to like Adam or Osmo denominator, yeah. you can see that that, that cliff down is Luna and USD flat. Uh, so, you know, Arrow was a Cosmos chain and like, they ended up making over half up. And then Luna and USD were almost like half of Osmos liquidity. We were the biggest stack for USD. But then as they crashed, like obviously a lot of liquidity went away. Uh, also, it hit the Osmo price pretty hard just because of the way that Osmo or dynamics was set up. Because what happened was like you had these liquidity pools and Osmo is like the base pair for most of them. And so what happened was people were selling Luna for Osmo, selling Osmo for Atoms, and selling so as people were selling out of Luna, that means they were also selling out of Osmo. Uh, is that that's how people were buying and then getting like bad and then swapping? Uh, uh, that was a very common way. Yeah. Is there a solution for that? Like, I mean, it's, it's, that, would, that would mean that in the real world, like people are coming into like Cosmos tokens, like you should have those Cosmos tokens through something like Adam or maybe an Osmo itself. Like, then you kind of have this, uh, like your effect is your price effect is yeah, but yeah, agree that as like as people as the demand for problems as it's go up, then Osmo also is up. Then like, yeah. it, it, it is interesting that Osmo is like just like has that like liquidity balance yeah. to it. Um, I guess how that's being bigger than that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, as you demand for more assets on Ethereum, people just buy, buy, eat, then buy. Yeah. Is there what do you what's like the next uh. What do you see as the next big projects that are that are or like, next big things that are needed or can 
should be coming up on this that on this uh, ecosystem like uh, I mean I guess it's a question for Ethereum as well, but you know you said that it's actually good with this kind of ecosystem. Um, but like what's next after you kind of move to the right? Oh um well I was thinking AMM was useful for the tracking system in the sense that the order books and stuff. Order books and console liquidness like you would get like a long term for Dex. Um but I don't I mean other things are necessary. Um I mean there's a lot of stuff that's like kind of rolling out in the coming next like, months, right? Like I don't think Hobbit has been that protocol yet, but I think Mars will do that. I think there's like, you know, we don't have a good decentralized stable coin anymore. Uh yeah. but there's a couple of launching in the coming months. Uh there's what is, uh is is, is there anything of concrete and other about those uh, stable coins? Like, how do they have some new math or whatever that's interesting? To promise? No, not really. Yeah, they're guess. all just like maker of new clones. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of maker clones or like make, like, I think like maker only became as big as it did. Like, there's like a lot of path dependencies on like, you know, Guy launched before there was USDC and Tether on Ethereum. And then the way that the curve wars happened was like, you know, you had the three pool, and then the curve wars, you know, people pair three pool LP shares with other uh, stable coins in the curve wars. And that kind of like the curve wars just sort of like cemented dies like uh, position. And I think that was like a very, like, I don't know if that's replication. Yeah. But like, just like, I don't know. So the problem with like decentralized stable coins is they're like, you have two options. You're either very much capped on the like the supply is only capped on the like CDP based anymore. The supply is capped on the like, amount of the demand for leverage in the system. Like the only way new die is created is because people want to lever up on you know, whatever the collateral is. Or you to solve that, you do what Maker did and you allow yourself to be like create die with USDC. But then you end up being like 60, 70% of the collateral back by USDC. And it's like how decentralized is this for you? Like Rux. Yeah. So that's kind of like why uh I don't know, I'm a little bit skeptical about like decentral like CDP the like the success of like CDP based stable coins. Unless you do a, I mean maker is like kind of going into this world of like okay being being more like a bank where they're like taking in like real world assets. So like as long as there's demand for leverage on you know if the demand for leverage on crypto isn't high enough, if the demand for leverage on like other off chain assets is high enough, and maybe this is. But I know at the same time, ever since the, I don't know, I haven't been following, Maker has been having a lot of politics recently in the last six months, and I haven't been following really closely mm -hmm. because some people who wanted to go way more towards like the, you know, real world asset backing, like taking in like commercial loans and stuff, and like do the back to back guy. But I know Arun, who's like the, one of the founders, he's like, after the whole USDC like pause tornado crash, yeah. he's like gone fully like, okay, we gotta like remove all like real world links on DAI and like have it be fully maximally decentralized. And the problem is to do that, you need to do what Reflexer did. So like, have you heard of Rai? Rai is a, another stable coin, but it doesn't, track one dollar exactly the, the exchange rate is meant to fluctuate slightly and so i know rune wants to go more towards like that model is it just like kind of like a is basically the token just like designed so that it's it's change doesn't happen for the like so it's like like a stable bracket more so than a peg it's like more of a window so that'll allow yeah. us to absorb some more of that volatility there yeah so it's a it's a, uh, it's a adjusting peg it's like, oh, we're going to target a $1 pet. Okay, we realize we're not able to do this. So we're going to start refunding. Okay, that's not working. We're restart. We're going to start targeting. Uh, okay. right, I don't know if you want me to go into details of why it has to do this. I guess at okay. least okay. just can, the but... inputs other than being easier and more and more feasible, what are the other upsides to doing so? There's just... Oh, the reflex surf? Yeah. It, it's, um, okay, I'll, I'll explain why you have to do this. Uh, you guys know how perps work, like a perpetual future? I think the next finance group that uh, was going to yeah. happen is just... Wait, that's the last one. Oh, I missed it. So. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, the part that's important is you have, like, people taking a long position and a short position on an asset. And what you need is if there's too many people taking a long position, not enough people taking a short position, you need these to be 
it's roughly even where you do they have this thing called a funding rate where it's like okay people who are taking a long position have to pay a fee to the people that are taking the short position and what this does is it caught it incentivizes people to either a close out their long position because they don't want to keep paying that fee or it incentivizes more people to come in and take the short position so they can earn that fee um so this is like and it, the same thing happened the other direction. There's too many people want to hold a short and not enough people want to hold a long. There's a funding rate in that direction. Maker operates very similarly to a perk, where what there is is there's two actors involved. There's people getting leverage on ETH, and there's people uh, not shorting ETH. But what they're doing is they're hold, hold, holding DAI. So what, okay, the people who are, who are taking leverage, right? What are they doing? They're taking ETH, putting it in their CDP, minting DAI, but then they're selling that DAI to someone else for more ETH to put in their CDP again, mint more DAI. Take that DAI, give it to someone for more ETH, put it in, and they're like levering up on ETH. That means, but the, per, the DAI holders, those are people who are selling ETH in order to acquire a DAI, right? So you could argue that in a way, the DAI holders are short, short ETH while the, while the, in a world where the unit of account is ETH, right? By, by selling ETH for DAI, they're shorting ETH while the people are leveling up or long. Now, what happens if the demand for left? So what, what that means is there has to be an equal, roughly equal amount of demand for taking leverage on ETH as there is for holding DAI. Now, if the demand for leverage is higher than the amount of people wanting to hold DAI, Maker has a way to solve that. They, they have a funding rate. It's what they it's called the uh, stability fee and the die savings rate, which is basically the stability fee is saying like, hey, okay, CDP holders have to like pay this fee like in for the amount of how, how much they have in the CDP. And then that gets given to die holders. Die holders like can put their die into a contract and they earn this die savings rate that comes with the stability fee being paid by the loan by the CDP holders. The thing about this, this is a funding rate. It's the longers paying the shorter. So that will either, if the fee is too high, CDP holders will close out their positions, or more people will hold die in order to get that die saving. That's great. What do you do in the other direction? What if there's more people who want to hold die than there is demand for leverage long on you? This happens during a bear market. Um, not that they don't be leverage long on you. So, this is a problem because what make what would happen? Okay, so there's two ways of solving this. You need negative. One is you need negative interest rates. You need a you need a way a funding rate in the other direction where okay, die holders, you guys want to hold die, but there's not enough demand for leverage to sustain that supply of die. So you have to start paying a fee in order to incentivize these leverage leverage need people to keep minting more die. And so you can do this with negative interest rates, which is like the value of DAI has to go down. And this is literally what Reflexor does, that it says, hey, if there's too much demand for holding the stable coin and not enough for paying leverage, it will cause the, how, how they implement the negative interest rates is they just cause the price of RAI to, to like decrease slightly. Is that by, in DAI, like you can, they can sell the maker to a way, uh, or like they want to, I know there's some like functionality maker like, yeah. where they sell the maker token to like yeah, yeah but, 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 but this part the, the maker token is like, the maker token doesn't matter. Oh. This is just dynamics between die holders and CPU holders. Okay. So how do they make the price of uh, like the of Ryan go down? Yeah. Uh, uh what you do is you it's how much because how, how does die get like pegged mm. to a dollar? Is that like CDP holders have to buy like if they have this much dollars worth of debt, they have to pay back, pay it back and die, right? How, how they make the price of RAI go down is just make it so CDP holders have to buy less, you know, pay less RAI in order to close out those positions. That is naturally causing the price to go down. Yeah. Uh, how Maker solved it was instead of letting the price fluctuate, what they said was, oh, we're just gonna allow die to be backed by USDC. So that way, so what you can imagine is let's say you didn't have this to do this. What could happen? What would happen is die holders could actually start like holding die hostage against the CDP holders, right? 
the ticket fee holder, let's say they have to be 50% over collateralized, right? So they need, like, what's the price of die could actually keep fluctuating, keep going above a dollar, right? Because, you know, the die holders can say, no, oh, okay, you know, imagine there's only two people in the system, right? It's just, it's just me and you, right? You're the die holder, I'm the CDP holder. I have like a dollar fifty of like ETH that's stuck in here unless I can get one die to pay it back. You can extort me. Like you could be like, oh, pay me a dollar forty cents for this die so you can get out your dollar fifty of ETH, right? And so that's why the, the yeah. And so that's why like you need this negative interest rate as well as or, or you do what Baker does and said, like, hey, as the CDP holder, I can show up, provide one USDC, mint a die. Use that die to close out my position, and now the die that you are holding is instead backed by the USDC instead. So that's why having a, like a pool of assets is important, so you're not you have a, a flexibility. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so the point here is that the US die needs to allow itself to make or allow die to be back one to one for US for USDC. Oh, is it, is it unique to USDC or like? This is unique to USDC. Oh, okay. it's not a they like a privilege case USDC oh. and say like you can mix every other asset you need to over collateralize. Yeah. USDC, they're like, no, no, you can provide one USDC and it will mint you one die. Oh. This is called the PSM, the price stability module. Okay. But because of this, because we're in like a bear market, there's not as much demand for leverage, but people still want to be holding die because of her boards and all this stuff. It made it so that die is like over 50% back by USDC in this point. And then, so in the Rye model, would the price, like where does the price stabilize at? Oh, the, uh, so, the, oh. so when Rye starts, so there's no, so the, the peg that Rye tracks has fluctuated over time. Yeah. They did something weird where they started it at $3.14 because they were worried that if they started at $1 and then the peg changes to like, let's say 95 cents, which is expected behavior. Yeah. They were worried that people would freak out and think that the peg is broken and like panic. Uh, so that's why they're like, okay, let's start at something that's- Dude, So people went for? Yeah. That's funny. And let's start, let's start at 3.14, so that way people don't freak out if it's not exactly $1. And like, I don't know, I think that was a little bit, there's a term like too clever by half. I think it was, that was like too clever. It was like too clever by half. I think. It, Actually, hurt rise adoption quite a bit because of that. People didn't realize it's a stable coin. Uh, is is it? Well, you know what the value is at now? Is it? Is it? Has it did, did, did it go down to uh, roughly about the third? Uh, I just do. Is it R A I? R R A I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, reflex index. No, no, no. Oh, 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 oh,
Um, with so, stuff like this, we get a mechanism for enabling that. So, like, that can have like, several stable uh, currencies or we get those local currencies to be like, or something. So, yeah, I mean, maybe. Uh, I think that if you are going to build an over collateralized CDP based stable coin, I think going down the Rye route is more interesting than going down the Maker route because Maker was, I mean, like I said, Rune is trying to turn Maker into Rye now because he's like, okay. You know, we gotta like cut off all links to USDC and you know, all the other assets. We're gonna go back to be fully like E and like only and like you know BTC and only the centralized stuff back. Like he wants to make it so it all guys start following the blockchain. Let's tell you probably, probably a good thing in the space in, in, in general because like the stable code is specifically is a weird concept in general, but just giving more like, rather rather than like creating a new so the idea the original idea of creating a new currency is not yeah. Like, Back and control my head, it's just like a link now. It's like, yeah, we can load it all the way. Right? So it probably doesn't have to like make it such a good. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my hot take is that I think Terra is still, I still think Terra is a hard time. But I think that like there was things that went. Do you think it's a, what? Do you think it was a tag that was more of an artificial downfall than? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's an attack that should be expected, right? Like, yeah. if your thing is going to work, it should be able to get attacks. Uh, I think that the problem with I'm already I'm working on a blog post about this right now, but like, I think that, like, you know, when it's asking the least one for you. <laughs> what? Like, let's hear you asking the least one for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the post is about like this January off. Like, there's like, it's, I think the six month anniversary of the collapse is going to come up next month, so I want to. Okay, there's my retrospective on there are like how Cosmos and Osmosis were so affected by it. But my hot take on Terra is that like, you know, when they first came to us, they had this like thesis, which is like, hey, okay, so I'm a fiat max. I love fiat cards. I think they're really um like and I, when they first came to us, they came to us with this like in this office, they were like, Hey, our goal is to build this currency that like our, our, the hypothesis is. If we can drive real demand for a stable coin, then like you can keep its stability, right? Like Maker relies on like so if you think about it, right? Maker has all these like complex systems of over collateralization and everything to keep it stable. You know, but at the end of the day, what's key, like the stability comes from the fact that there's enough demand for that, right? Like otherwise, what Maker does is because of the over collateralization in the case that it's like there's not enough demand, the supply will shrink as well as you know, or you do a reflex or does, and the uh, the price goes there, right? But eventually, um, so Terra's whole piece of hypothesis was like, okay, get all this over collateralization stuff. If you can just build real demand, that's all that matters. That's what the real fiat, that's what fiat currencies are, right? All they do is like they're not backed by anything, they're the same thing, you can't real demand. Um, and they did that for a while, you know. I mean, they, they claimed they did it for a while, but whether their whole payment stuff was real or not. They claim that it was being used for payments and like fake and stuff. Like, I don't know. I've heard that time a little bit of a scam. If it was real, they were also building things like Mirror and stuff. It's like, okay, let's build the synthetic protocol and build DeFi assets that use USB. At some point, they got really greedy and they realized that, hey, as the supply of USD keeps going up, the price of Luna keeps going up, and like, okay. Then they built Anchor, which is this like scam that like gave people 20% returns on deposited UST. And it was like this giant Ponzi that was released. And what was also really annoying, so it, one, it was inorganic demand, it was not real demand, right? And the second thing it also did was it actually made it harder for real demand to form because like Cosmosis, we were building a lending protocol called Isotonic. Um, in order to get deposits of UST into this thing, we have to beat the 20% return from Anchor. And that's like hard to do. And so it actually made it harder for like real demand to actually form. You get to compete against this 20% fake yield. And so the problem is that as soon as things are a little tough and there's a little bit of instability, everyone's running from the door and that caused the entire system to collapse. So that's, that's what you mean by real demand, right? Demand that's stickier. Yeah, demand that's stickier. Demand that like, you know, people are actually using it every day, like, you know, yeah, there's organic real demand that would touch me. That I think that has that potentially can keep us in some state. Um, but because of anger, like what 90 more, more than 90 percent of people being 50 
not for real demand, it's probably all right. So no, I'll print it. Uh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it would have survived. Well, I think it could have. I think it still could have looked. I think the experiment that was set out to be conducted never got conducted. So I don't know whether it would have survived or not. But like, it sucks that we'll never know the answer to that question. At least for another few years, prepare both fish or something like that. <laughs> that's our that's our quote for the library circle <laughs> that's great so okay, i'm actually gonna end the recording here just so we're, we're a little over five um yeah i hope i got all that um great well thank you everyone um and thanks for listening that was great and we'll, we'll catch you soon i'm gonna pop it in.